good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, Christ Church on the Move. My name is Charlie, and we're going to worship. If everybody would stand up, please. Great job. Take a minute and uh, give an air high five to the person next to you. Let's be socially responsible. Everybody say hi. <laughs> You were 
let it break at your name still call the sea to still the rage in me to still near to us today as we gather to celebrate who you are and what you've done 
May your name be praised. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, uh, hi, welcome. Hey guys, just want to remind you each week, we receive an offering here at Church on the Move. Uh, there are trays set up in the back tables and one by the door on the way out the door. If you came prepared to give a gift, that's a great way you can do that. Um, text to giving, online donations are also a wonderful way that you can do that. Uh, we shared last week one of the things that we want to do in preparation for Easter. We want to finish off uh, our stage here and, and finish the baptistry that's going to sit right behind this window here beneath the cross. That was one of the, the final steps to this, uh, the whole building process that just never got uh, not finished. And so we're, we're asking people to dig deep by Easter. And if you're willing to give a gift to, to go towards that, uh, that, that, that fund, that would be wonderful. And so uh, you can do that online. There's an online tab that just says Easter offering. You can just put uh, designated item in your check if you want to do that. But we're just inviting the church to be a part of that story. Help us finish off some of the last things that just didn't get done with this new building. And that would go a long way to get us to where we need to be. Uh, second thing um, is uh, we are going to be uh, selling some t-shirts uh, in your bulletins. There should be an insert there. Uh, many of you were part of the, the last church uh, church orders that have been like a long time ago. So uh, these are brand new uh, op opportunities. And, and you notice there's a price difference that the, the, the made new ones, these are going to be our baptism t-shirts, okay? And so uh, what we want to do is we want to buy, every, every time you buy a shirt that says made new, we're going to buy a shirt for somebody that's going to get baptized eventually in the future and give them a shirt of their own. And so uh, that extra $5 is going to go towards buying them a shirt. So, so you're actually making an investment in someone's decision to follow Christ if you buy those shirts. Uh, they come in blue and gray, uh, banana cream and then black and green over there for the live breathe move uh just if you guys want to be a part of that what i need you to do though is you need to pre-order them we're not going to buy a bunch of extra shirts and have them list laying around uh we want you guys if you want a shirt just tell us what size uh how many you want uh i think the the live breathe move the black ones come in kid sizes everything else will just be in adult sizes uh for simplicity uh but that would be just uh, something you can do you can turn those in any time between now and i think the middle of april is what i said on the sheet and uh and we'll just order some shirts and just be able to wear those out and, and about. Um, what else? Community Kitchen next Sunday, March 28th, is our Community Kitchen meal. The Lake Wells Care Center serves a meal to the downtown Lake Wells community. Uh, we're going to be preparing the meal, putting them in boxes, and sending them out. If you want to be a part of that service opportunity, just note that on your communication card. Uh, next week, I'll give you directions on where you need to go, uh, specifically downtown right after church. But that's uh, just an opportunity we do every other month. Um, we need volunteers. Uh, we need greeters. Uh, we need uh, greeters at the front door and the, the panned out bulletins just being a smiling face. If that's something you'd like to do, please just let me know. Uh, sign, up, sign up on the communication card or you can go see my wife at the front desk on the way out the door today and just let her know, hey, I'd like to be a greeter at some point. We also need people to clean uh, the facility. Uh, we've got a, uh, a small team that's rotating right now, but we need some other individuals, other families to come on board. If you can do that on a Friday or Saturday and just come up here and clean the church, we'd like to put you on a rotation. So there's ways that you can get connected in that. And I, I think that's it, right? I feel like I'm speaking like a mile a minute here. All right. Hey, uh, kids, grades K to five. This is your chance. Uh, Pastor Ann, you said you weren't going to be there, but there you are. I see. All right. There's Kona ice today. Uh, so I hope that's outside for the adults afterwards. So, all right. While the kids are leaving, you guys watch this video just to get us into the word today. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
Okay, guys, I love this psalm. I love the psalm we're going to talk about today. I love it because packed within these simple verses are, are all these reminders. Reminders of who God is, about what God's done, and more importantly, who I am. And what God calls us to do. And so David, he's writing this psalm and he says, he says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He says, you have set your glory in the heavens. And through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. And David writes, guys, even children get it. Even children can see, they understand. That it's not complicated. I think we make things complicated sometimes. It's, it's simple. It's undeniable. That's what Paul writes in Romans. It's undeniable. Our God, he's amazing. He's amazing. Our God is awesome. I mean, just look around you. Just look around. Open your eyes. Just look up at the night sky and sing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star with your kids and just be blown away by how awesome and amazing and incredible our God is. Be blown away by the majesty and the splendor of his name. Because David writes that God, he set his glory in the heavens. In fact, in Psalm 19, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And day after day, they pour forth their speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And David, he says to us, guys, the stars, the sky, it's telling us a story. It's telling us a story. If you would draw near and listen, it's got something to tell you. It's got something to teach you. It's got knowledge to share. It reveals something about God. Our God, he is big. And so let me see if I can put this in perspective. Uh, we, we, we live on planet Earth. Yes? yes? Okay, good. We're on the same page. Awesome. All right. Now, now the Earth is, 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 is pretty big, right? Like, if you think about us traveling around the world, that's a really long trip. I mean, if you think about us traveling across the country... That would take a really long time. Like our country is massive. It's huge. And you go over mountains and through valleys and, and across great plains to get from Florida to, let's say, Washington uh, all the way across the country. In fact, uh, but you think about the earth. The earth is so much bigger than even that. Like it's sometimes I'm trying to think about it, man, it's just so incredible. And if you were to take a tape and, and measure the diameter of the earth, it's uh, estimated to be 7,917 miles. In diameter. That's how wide our earth is. And guys, God made that. Scripture says that he spoke it into existence. And he, he, he told the sea where they would go and the land to form. Like God made it all. This massive, this beautiful planet that we live on. That's incredible. But let's, let's draw it out just a little bit. Let's think about our sun. Okay, the center of our solar system. All right, to us it seems pretty small as it just kind of hangs in the sky as we look at it. But that's because it's 93 million miles away from us. If you were to take that measuring tape to the sun, if you could get close enough and take a measuring tape to the sun, it would measure 864,938 miles wide. All right, and God made that. Like God commanded the sun to shine. He said, let there be light. He hung, this, he hung it right where he wanted in the cosmos. He said, I'm going to put you here, son, and this is where you're going to be. He hung it precisely where he wanted it to be. And so you think about the earth, how big this world is. And you think about the sun and how much bigger that is. It's incredible. And so let me just give you a visual because I think sometimes if you toss out random number facts, it's like, oh, okay, that's a, lot of, that's a big number. But we don't actually think about what that actually means. Okay? And so Louis Giglio likes to use this illustration of a golf ball. All right? If you take the golf ball and you say, uh, so let, let, let's imagine this golf ball re represents planet Earth. I mean, can you imagine yourself just like sitting somewhere on this golf ball, like zooming in to find yourself on this golf ball? You need like a microscope to find yourself on this golf ball, just on planet Earth, right? Like you'd have to zoom in. If, if a golf ball represented planet Earth, then, you would, then, then in comparison, the sun would be 15 feet wide in diameter. Again, random number facts, okay? That's like three of me stacked on top of each other, okay? Because I'm not a tall guy, all right? It's three Steves would be 15 feet, just maybe, maybe a, little bit, a little bit more, all right? 15 feet. Or let me take it, to, maybe you've noticed the, the, the yellow tape here around uh, the, the screen here. If you take this yellow tape right here and you take it up to the wooden frame up at the very top and you go all the way to this yellow tape to that yellow tape, that's 15 feet wide, that's 15 feet high. That's how big the sun is compared to the earth. You draw a circle there, that's our sun. You can fit 109 of these earths 
on the face of our sun. That ferocious fireball that gives us warmth, that gives us light. It is so massive compared to planet Earth. And planet Earth is so massive compared to us. It's incredible. It's incredible to think about it. But the sun, it isn't even, in a, bi- it isn't even a big star. It's a G2 yellow dwarf star. We've talked about that before. It's like a little star compared to stars in the galaxy. Compared to all these different stars, it's, it's all the other twinkling lights that got painted across the night sky. And in our galaxy alone, the Milky Way galaxy, there's at least 200 billion stars. 200 billion stars just hanging out there in the cosmos. And the closest star to us, the closest star to, to, to our, 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 our planet, other than the sun, if you were to jump into a rocket and use the best propulsion systems we have, it would take you 75,000 years to make it to the next star. 75,000 years. And that's just to the closest star. There's 200 billion more out there in our solar system, our galaxy alone. And then the Milky Way, it's just one of 100 billion galaxies, they say. One of billions of galaxies which contain, contain hundreds of billions of stars. That's a lot of stuff. just out there in the universe. Many of those stars are bigger than the sun that we have at our center. And yet scripture says in Isaiah 40 that God measures the span of the universe by the breadth of his hand. Like the God that we worship is the God that says to the universe, yeah, it's about that big. Do you get that? Like Isaiah 40 says, it's, it, he measures it by the width of his hand. And, and Paul said to the Colossians that, that in Jesus, all things are created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in Jesus, he is holding it all together. Guys, our God is big. Our God is so much bigger than, than, than we give him credit for. And I think what David is trying to do here in these simple verses is to say to us, guys, you need to expand your scope. You need to have a moment where you enlarge your perspective. Like the God we worship is so much more incredible. He's so much more majestic. He's so much more colossal than anything that we can fathom. He is beyond us. He is big. But in the same breath, David says that our God's focus is also small. Like when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for him. Like guys, guys, the heavens are telling a story. They're painting a picture, all right? And and if that's true, there must be an audience to receive that message. There must be a recipient to the story. If a story is being told, there has to be someone that's listening, someone that's hearing, someone that it's meant for. And so consider this. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's called the Darling of Astronomy. And maybe you've seen pictures, maybe you've heard people talk about it. The Whirlpool Galaxy, it sits opposite of our Milky Way Galaxy. And it consists of about 300 billion stars, they say. And if you wanted to travel to the Whirlpool Galaxy, it's 31 million light years away. 31 million light years away. Now, we don't probably have a concept of what that means. Again, we lose something when we talk about just random number facts just out in in the air. Okay, so light speed. Light travels at a speed of 186,000 miles per second. All right, that means in one of our calendar years, light will travel, one beam of light, one single beam of light will travel 5.88 trillion miles. 5.88 trillion miles. Okay, so if you had one golf ball... And this golf ball represented 5.88 trillion miles. If the width of this golf ball, that was 5.88 trillion miles. All right, and, and, and you would have to line up 31 million of these. And that's how far you would have to travel to get to the Whirlpool Galaxy. That's a line of golf balls side by side going out this door, traveling north, northwest, across the state of Florida, across the Gulf of Mexico, And you'll wind up somewhere between Galveston and Houston, Texas. That's how long this line of golf balls would be. 5.88 trillion miles each to get to the uh, the, Whirlpool Galaxy. One golf ball per year. One golf ball per year. That's right. It's about to be. 
So, so the next time you're able to, just jump into a rocket ship, travel 186,000 miles per second for 31 million years, and you'll make it to the Whirlpool Galaxy. Now that seems unlikely for us. All right, that's probably not gonna happen. But through the magic of, of tele telescopes, what we never are going to physically experience, we can actually at least visually experience. And since 1990, the Hubble telescope has been in orbit, snapping pictures of far off stars, far off galaxies. And at one point, astronomers decided, you know what, I'm going to zoom in on that bright spot in the center of the Whirlpool galaxy. I just want to zoom in, and they found a black hole, but they also found this really, really cool picture. And they call this the X like structure at the center of the black hole of the Whirlpool galaxy, but it's not hard to see what it is. It's not hard for you and I to see the cross. Like, through the grandness of the universe, we see the glory of God. And isn't it amazing how we're searching high and low for proof? We're searching high and low for some type of evidence, for some type of reality. And it's like God's like, it's, I haven't made it hard. I've put my fingerprint everywhere. I, I, I'm drawing you in all these different ways. Like, from 31 million light years away, God said, you know what, I'm going to put something there that somebody's going to see, and it's going to tell them about me. It's going to tell them about my glory. It's going to tell them about my love. It's going to draw them in. God thought to put something 31 million light years away. Even in the greatness of the universe, God is writing messages. He is leaving signs of his love and grace for those who are searching. For those who would simply open, his eye, open their eyes, even though his, he is big, his focus is on us. His focus is on you. David says, what is mankind that you're mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. And David's like, God, I see your works. I see your splendor. I see your greatness displayed. Everywhere I look, I see evidence of you. And I don't get it. I don't get it. God, why do you care about me? Why am I even a blip on your radar screen? How can it be that the, the God of this grand universe is mindful of me? Guys, do you ever feel that way? Like, do you ever wonder what God would see in you, in me, like in us? Like, God, why would you even care? Why is this even something that, that draws you in? Like, God, if you are God and you know everything and, and you see everything, then surely you can see my life. Surely, surely you know the things that I am, the things that I've done. You can see into my heart. And when you do, God, you're going to know. You're going to know all the things that, that you already do. And you're going to just walk on by. You know I'm not worthy. You're, just gonna, you're not even going to give me a second glance. If you would know, if you could see, you would know. But look what David writes. He says in verse 5, you've made them, humans, lower. A little lower than the angels. A little lower than the Elohim. And you crown them with glory and honor. Guys, do you understand? Like in all of creation, like when you consider the work of God's hands... When you look at everything, the mountains, the stars, the sun, the, uh, everything, that you are his prized creation, that, that, that you are the pinnacle of, of, of the Genesis story, that, that somehow you and I, we are the point uh, of what God was wanting to do. You read Genesis 1, and, and God made human beings in his image. In his likeness. And it wasn't until that moment that God proclaimed that all creation was very good. And David Platt, he writes this. He says, unlike anything else in all of creation, we are made in the image of God. I mean, just think about that. that like right now where you're sitting, right now, like, like you are made in the image of God. And you are grander and more majestic than the stars and the moons and the mountains and the hills and the oceans. You... You are more majestic than any of those. Be awed by this. Let that sink in this morning. Be awed by this. Be awed by the fact that the God over everything, over all creation, amidst everything else, has created you as one who resembles him and represents him and reflects him more than any of these other things. More than the Grand Canyon, 
More so than the Himalayan heights, more so than the most beautiful beaches you could imagine, the most majestic scenery you could ever fathom or picture in your mind, you are created in God's image. You are created as his representative. You have beauty. And you, you possess dignity and an honor that nothing else in creation has. And so be affirmed today. Because you are loved by a big God with a very, very big heart for you. And guys, he planted greatness. He planted glory into your life. You were created to reflect his image. We were made to be his representative in the world. To rule with him. To build his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. See, humans were given dominion. Humans were given a mission. Humans were meant to bring God's purposes to life in the world around him. We were meant to advance his kingdom. I mean, look what David writes. He says, you made them rulers over the work of your hands. And you put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea, Lord. It's incredible how majestic is your name in all the earth. See, I love this psalm because it, it, it just reminds me that God is awesome. That God is incredible. He is so much bigger than anything I can fathom. He alone is the maker of the heavens. He's alone the maker of the earth. And he made us. He made me. He cares for us. And not only that, he gives us purpose to pursue. He gives us a mission to, to, to be on. And here at Church on the Move, we believe that we're called to be ambassadors of the kingdom. That we're called to bring that mission, to bring that purpose, to bring that, that gospel message to the world around us. And guys, I want you to think about this. If the God who is so big and so massive, the God that says the universe is just this big, guys, if that God is willing to draw near to us, sitting on our tiny earth-sized golf ball, if that God is willing to come near to us, shouldn't we listen? Shouldn't we let him decide if we're worthy to do the mission he's called us to or not? Shouldn't we respond with a little bit of awe and wonder and say, I don't get it, but I'm going to do it? Like at Church in the Move, we believe that we're called to do. And so as a church, we teach that if we have genuine community here as a body of believers, that if we build this church strong as a family, and if we come and gather together and we breathe in the breath of God and we grow and we study and we, we, we increase in knowledge and we increase in, in, in the power of the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, when we do that, it's going to compel us to do something. It's going to compel us to move out of this space to change the world. Our God is moving, and we need to be on the move with Him. And so let's talk about that. What does it mean to be God's imagers in the world? What does it look like for us to actually fulfill that purpose and to fulfill that calling in our lives? Well, Isaiah 61 verse 1, it says it this way. It says, The Spirit of the Lord, the Eternal One, is on me. The Lord has appointed me for a special purpose. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to repair broken hearts and declare those who are held captive and bound in prison to be free from your imprisonment. And Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 1, he says it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So stand firm then. And don't let anything yoke you in slavery again. Don't let anything imprison you again. Don't let anything chain you up again. And guys, what we need to hear, what people need to hear is number one, there is freedom to be found in Jesus. There is freedom to be found in his name. And still others need to hear the message that if, if Christ has set you free, and you are free indeed. Right? right? Some people need to hear for the first time, you can be set free. And some of you, some of your friends, some of your other fellow believers in Jesus Christ, they need to be reminded that you're supposed to be free. That you don't have to live in bondage anymore. Jesus broke those chains. Don't go back to them. Like we need to hear both those messages and let them sink in because there's a big difference between being set free and actually living in that freedom. And we believe our God, he's a chain-breaking God. But you and I, we've got to stop picking back up the chain. We've got to stop being bound by things that God broke in our lives. I mean, think about that. Remember in the Old Testament, the God, God delivers the Israelites and he sets them free with a mighty hand and out army. armies, leading them out of Egypt. And they get to the Red Sea and, and the, the, their backs against the sea and Egypt's coming down. The chariots are, are racing towards them and they start freaking out like, why did you bring us out here to die? 
They said, why, why would you do this? It was so much better in Egypt where they were slaves. Because they're saying to Moses, it's so much easier to know what's coming than to trust God now. Why did we ever let you set us free? And so many people, they've been set free, but it's really hard to live in that freedom, to trust God in those moments. And what did Jesus say? He said, there's a thief. He says, there's a thief. There's an enemy that wants to steal and kill and destroy your life. Like, Believers, there is an enemy, there is evil that wants to draw you away from the purposes of God in your life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life. I've come to give you the fullest, most abundant life. But there is, there is this battle for your heart that keeps wanting to pull you back into the chains that you left behind. Jesus says, I've come to give you abundant life, but you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to move in it. You're going to have to cling to it. And our mission at Church in the Move is to move with God, to move people to that abundant life in Jesus. Because we believe God's moving, that he's active, that he's seeking out the lost, and he's drawing them to himself. He's putting signposts all over the universe for us to see and for us to point to and say, that's how big our God is. That's what he, he longs to draw us in. And we want to pursue his purpose. And the beautiful thing about God is, is some, for some reason he says, guys, I want to use you. You are my representative. You are my image in the world. You're supposed to be doing this with me. Not, not just by yourself, but I'm going to be with you and we're going to do it together. It's going to be really cool. We're going to partner together. We want to move with God to change the world that we see around us. And so as a church, our community in here, it exists for the world out there. What we do in here, it's existing that we might change the world around us. Does that make sense? Is, it, is, that, is that sinking in? Like the reason we come here each week... The reason we gather here, the reason we worship God and we celebrate our faith, the reason we connect with one another and nurture this family, it's not about building a holy bubble so that we can all be insulated from the world around us. It's not about building a hotel for saints. Like guys, this is not the main event. Okay, this is not what God called us to do. He didn't say, I want you to build a building and then I want you to gather together and put on the lights and put on the show and, and, and do worship shows. Like, that's not what God called us to do. He said, I want you to, to be a body that's faithful to me. That you might be a hospital for the sinners. That brings healing. That brings life and restoration. That, 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 that's a place where we grow in faith, but that we grow in action too. This is not the main event. It's vital to what we do, but it's not the point. We live in community and we breathe in the breath of God so that we might have the strength to move to change the world around us. That we might have the strength to shine his light to the people that need to see, the people that need to come, the people that need to gather. Because there are lost people everywhere. They are desperately in need to be found. That's the reason the church exists. That's the mission God's called us to. We shine our lights so that we, they might see that there's a better way. Guys, that's your job. That's your mission. That's your purpose. That's what we were made to do. More than anything else that you value in your life, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to be a light. You are called to be part of a restoration mission. To restore what was lost in Eden, to bring it back under God's dominion, God's reign. You are called to be his witness and to share your faith with the people around you. Like he broke your chains. He saved you so you might point others to the Savior. That's our purpose. And we need to be about that purpose. Because right now, there are a lot of people still living in bondage. There are a lot of people still chained to their addictions, still chained to their poverty, still chained to their unforgiveness and their bitterness and their, their shame. Their feelings of unworthiness. There are a lot of people out there that are desperately in need of someone to come alongside them and share them the hope that we know. They need for you to shine. Because guys, the only thing that's going to last beyond this world is people. Do you know that? Like the only thing that's not temporary are the people that God's placed 
on this earth. It's the people in your life. It's, it's your family, your spouse, it's your kids. It's your friends, your coworkers. It's, it's the person you bump into at the supermarket today. It's, it's the teacher at school. It's, it's that kid on the other side of the world that's starving. It's the, the kid that's on the other side of town that's starving right now. It's every single person that you've ever locked eyes with. They are not temporary. They will last beyond this world. And we believe that every single person will spend an eternity with God or without God. And so listen, if you want to, uh, you can build your life on things that are temporary. You can build your life on your job, your money, your hobbies, your stuff, your goals, your dreams. You can live for all that and more. I mean, people do it all the time. But for me, I want my life to be invested in something that's going to last. And I want my life to be invested in something that's going to be eternal. People matter. And that mission drives the heart of who we are here at Church on the Move. It has to. And so we think about how big God is. And we recognize that that big God somehow has a purpose for us, little old us. And so what do we do with that? What's the action step today? Because we're always like, okay, you got me for a second, but what do I do with that? Okay, let me just give you one, one thought today, because that's all we need. Guys, we need to go where Jesus calls us to go. Uh, if we just start doing that, if we start going where Jesus calls us to do, if we start listening to his voice and just doing what he said, if we just go where he calls us to go, we'd see change. That's what we have to do. We, we need to commit to one another. Hey, we're, we're just going to start going where Jesus calls us to go. We're going to be on mission together. We're going to turn to one another and we're going to say, guys, let's just go where Jesus called us to go. That's what we got to do today. In Isaiah 117, it says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of the widows. And what the prophet is saying here is, hey, hey guys, your faith, it's got to be more than just belief. There's got to be some kind of action that backs this up. Don't just say what you're going to do. Do it. You've got to move in this moment. And I'm telling you, part of the problem that we have in the church today is that we have an overwhelming number of believers that are just sitting on the sidelines. And we're just watching the show. I came here for the show. Uh, this is going to fill me up and make me feel good, uh, and, but, but we're not putting anything into practice. We talk about a lot of things, but we don't actually do a lot of things. And, and let me tell you, it gets kind of boring. It gets kind of boring to just kind of talk about things. We'll debate theology, or we'll debate worship styles, or what translation of the Bible is best, and what do you think about this interpretation of Scripture, and have you ever thought about what this Greek word means versus this, this Hebrew translation of the word? And, and we straight out gnats of theology. As if that's somehow going to, 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 to do the mission that God calls to do. But are we actually connecting with people who need Jesus? Like when was the last time you, you, you were bold enough to share your faith with somebody? And say, this is why I believe what I do. And this is why I think it matters. And I'm, I'm so desperate for you to understand because it matters for you. Jesus called his followers to pursue his purpose. To be on mission. And each day is an opportunity to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Each interaction is a new chance for us to transform someone's story forever. And so guys, right now, if you want to if, if see God, if you want to feel God, if you want to know God more, then here's what you need to do. You need to come in here week after week and you just breathe in. You breathe in his grace. You breathe in his love. You breathe in his goodness. You just inhale really big all, all the, 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 the spirit of God, the message, the, the word. But you go out. You go out into your world. You go out into your community. You go find some dark corner uh, where somebody is hurting and you just exhale all of that love and all that grace and all that goodness. And when you do, you will see God move. We are desperate to see God move. Many of us, were sitting here, we're bored because we just don't feel it. We don't see it. That's how you see it. You got to put it into action. We move with God to move people to life. And when lives start coming alive, man, that gets us excited. That, that sets us on fire. We're going to go where Jesus calls us to go. And guys, we need to go today. Because Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And so many people are on it. And so we said a couple weeks ago, every one of us, we're walking a path. And it's very important to know which road that we're on. So they call it El Camino de la Muerte. 
It's the road of death, okay? All right, the road of death. Maybe you've heard it before. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank says it's the most dangerous, most deadliest uh, road in the world. About 200, 300 people lose their life on this road every single year. And it's not hard to understand. There's no guardrails. There's mudslides, there's rain, there's rocks that are falling, there's winding turns at every path. It goes from La Paz, uh, Bolivia, 12,000 feet in elevation down to the Amazon River Basin. It's a 43 mile long road that is a bad, bad road. I'm just curious, how many of you guys would travel this road? How many of you guys would be like, yeah, I'm, I'm driving that? Not even one? No, oh, man, all right, all right. But now, the people that do, you know, the yeses, you know, if you're a bold adventurer, like you're thinking, man, this would be such a great story. Like, I traveled the road of death, man. Like, it's awesome. Like, I, I lived. I, I went down the road of death, and I lived. Like, that, for anybody that says, yes, I'm going to do that, it's an adventure, right? This road actually tra- attracts so many tourists. Uh, it's become a tourist attraction because they, they want to ride the road of death. They want to drive the road of death. Even though 200, 300 people die each year on this road, they believe they've got what it takes. And that's how the logic is. Well, it won't happen to me. Like 200, 300 people die, but how many people live, right? Like, it's not, like let's not talk about that statistic. And, and, they, and they think to themselves, I'll be different. Now, it's going to be okay because I know what I'm doing. I'm driving since I was 16. I, I got this thing figured out. I'm, it's not going to be an issue. I can make it. I can do it. And they, they drive down the road of death looking for adventure. Looking for life. Looking for purpose. But guys, you're not going to find it here. You're not going to find life. You're not going to find adventure. You're not going to find what you're looking for. What you're desperate for. Here, apart from Jesus, there is no life. Apart from him, there's nothing. He's holding it all together. He's the one we need. And God in his grace, he has placed signposts all over the universe. Everywhere. Drawing us to him. Calling us home. You and I. You and I, we are signposts. That's what we're meant to be. We are imagers of God. We reflect his glory. We reflect his goodness. Like the sun shines and the moon reflects it, that's who we're called to be. And so my my challenge for us as a church is that we would shine. That we would be signs pointing people to Jesus, pointing people to true everlasting life. Amen? So may we move with God to move people to life. Let me pray. Father God, as we think about this word, As we let it uh, just sink in, God, would you just remind us yet again how big, how awesome, how amazing you are here in this place. God, just just step into our brains and just like, like, just blow our minds with how big you are. Give us just a glimpse, a picture, a a reality that that, that just shows us and reminds us that that, that you are all powerful, that you are all knowing, that you are always there. There's nothing outside of your dominion, outside of your reign, outside of your control. God, would you just explode our vision of who you are? And God, would you just let us sit and marvel of the reality that even though you are that big, that you draw near to something so small and so something so seemingly insignificant as as human beings, as, as, as us here in this place. And God, may that reality challenge us. May that reality draw us. May that reality send us out with, because he poured that great love into us that we would go out and share that love with the world. May your truth, may your light, may your grace just pour out of us as a people. God, don't let us gather in this place week after week thinking this is what it's all about. What we're doing here, it's good, but it's not everything. God, you called your people to go. I pray that we do that now. That we would go where you call us to go. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion, I thought I'd share a cute picture um, just to kind of soften things for a moment. I, I, this, this popped up on my phone 
uh, in one of those memories from way back when. Katie, my little daughter, uh, this was like 10, 11 years ago, oh, she's, she's eating her fingers. And she had this thing where she would constantly be eating her fingers or her hands and her mouth. And, and I remember just looking at her just thinking like, You're, uh, what, a, what a dummy right there, you know? Like, I've got the baba right here. And she's like, no, dad, I'm okay. I've got my fingers. And if that doesn't work, I'll just, I'll just devour my whole hand. And, and she would have this, have this pose all the time. And, and you would just think to yourself, like, like I think she really thinks that's going to satisfy her hunger. Like, I think she really thinks that that's what she needs in this moment, just to devour her hand right there. And, and we know that that's crazy. We know that that's not actually going to do anything for her. But are we any different? Like, are, are we really that different? Because I think we're all guilty of trying to consume things that are just never going to satisfy us. We're all guilty of living life in pursuit of some pleasure, some relationship, some, some activity or possession or thing. And, and we believe that if we could just grab hold of this, if we could just, if we could just pull it near to us, then we're going to be satisfied. If I could just devour my whole hand, then my, then my stomach will be full. And we've all traveled down the road of death in our lives, believing it will somehow bring us life. That it's somehow going to satisfy. But guys, it's a lie. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He says, he says I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, that's how you're going to produce fruit. But, uh, but apart from me, you can do nothing. And so here in this moment, as, as we take the bread in just a second, and we take the juice, these symbols of, of, of the sacrifice of our Savior, this is a moment for us to realign to His purposes. This is a moment for us to draw near to Him in communion and gather around His table and remember who He is. To remember what he's done. To remember the life that is found in him and him alone. So as we take the bread, as we take the juice, may we commune with the one that truly satisfies. God, draw near to us now. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, church, if we let them, God would fill us up so that we could be sent out into the world around us. And today, may you know that our God is awesome, that his name is majestic, that his glory is displayed all over the, the universe. Like the heavens declare the wonder of his name and he is beyond us in every way and yet he cares for us. Psalm 8 says he draws near to us that he is mindful of you. And not only that, but he gives you a purpose. He gives you a mission. He gives you something that you were meant to do. That purpose begins with a moment of surrender. That purpose begins as we decide to step out and say, Jesus, you're the one I'm going to serve. You're the kingdom I want to advance. You're the one I want to follow. And so as we sing a song of response today, maybe that's a decision that you need to make. To say for the first time that I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I see the signposts. I see you calling me in. And so God, I want to follow you. We invite you to do that as we stand and sing in just a moment. Just come to the front and talk with me. Or maybe as we sing this song, you just need to surrender all over to God again. The fact that you need to be moving. The world needs you to be a voice. So go. I'm going to go. Let's stand and sing. Let's respond to God. I surrender.
Amen. And guys, here's the reality. The more we know God more, the more we're going to want to go. So that others around us would know what we know. So may we move with God to move people to life. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good week.